Hey, hey, hey. What's good, fam? It's Tuesdays with Tawana. What's going on? I'm here. It's Tuesday. I'm Tawana, your host and curator of Tuesdays with Tawana, where we build community. One Tuesday, one moment, one Facebook Live, one podcast, one YouTube video, one moment, one shared story, one laughter, one tear, one experience at a time. What's up, Cordio? For those of you who will listen to this podcast later, you'll hear me shout out some per- some people because it's important to name people and invite them into community, into this space. This is not a podcast where you will just hear my story or my lens or my view. Um, we invite people on Facebook Live to comment, to share, to um, impart their wisdom and knowledge, or just to say what's up. So, you know, the rules of engagement in this community is, you know, you comment, I comment back. You shout me out in the comments, I'm going to shout you out. Um, if you just want to watch and just chill and just listen, I'm all good because the most important thing is that we get the word out and we get the messages out, whatever they may be. Hey, Mama Lovey, I love you. Good afternoon. Um, Whatever the message may be, it's important that we get it out. And today is part four of our domestic violence series for the month of October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And what's important about this month is that oftentimes, even during Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we don't talk about it enough. It it happens like cancer, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. What's up, Angela, in the building? Good to see you, my sister. Um, It happens year round. So I want to start a little bit about breast cancer awareness for a moment, just some reflection that I was having. And then I want to talk about domestic violence awareness and how we can um, move forward and um, how we can move forward and heal and make things happen. So um, the other day I was reading an article um, from one of the breast cancer organizations and it was uh, really talking about how upset they were about the commodification of the pink ribbon. Hey, Mother Carolyn, always a blessing to see you, always grateful for your prayers and your covering. Um, And they were upset about the pink ribbon. Um, and how corporations and organizations are using it to attract customers and the money that they say they're going to give is either very little or not really true to what they are telling the community and telling the public, right? So um, this organization is just very upset about the pink ribbon and exploiting it because we know with the pink ribbon and other ribbons that there's a story behind those ribbons, stories that don't always end or depict success or survival. If you like literal survival, we are grieving um, losses of people who have died Um, and succumbed to the challenges of cancer overall and in breast cancer, from breast cancer in general, because black women are still dying at disproportionate rates, even though their rate of diagnosis is uh, uh, decreasing. And that's not even true to form, meaning, you know, they go to the doctor, get the mammogram, and then they are... um, you know, diagnosed either they don't have it or they have it and they caught it early. Um, Some are just not going to the doctor. And that rolls into other things like lack of access, lack of health care, the treatment of um, patients with with doctors who um, are racist, uh, anti-black racist, 
Um, so there are so many different levels to this. So this organization is quite bothered by um, organizations and sports teams and others that dope the pink ribbon just for the sake of, of doing it. Now, again, you know, my caveat is always, this is never a blanket statement. This is someone's experience because there are some people in the sports world, in corporations who are honoring the life of a loved one, whether they're living or deceased, surviving and thriving in the midst of active treatment. So, so there's a lot of nuances with this. And I just encourage us to be mindful of when we are um, when we are bringing awareness that we bring awareness and the fullness thereof and we make sure that those dollars are recycled back into our communities whether it's like the stomp out breast cancer so donation where we pay for co-pays we pay for prescriptions and for you know grocery cards for healthy foods and transportation when people live on their own. Hey, DG. Oh, I'm so glad you are joining live. Hugs right back to you. Hugs from Harlem. Yes, I receive it. I receive it. So uh, making sure that those dollars are recycled back into our communities. And if these organizations or corporations are claiming that they are giving money back to organization, show us the receipts. You know, let us challenge these corporations so that they are not commodifying the pink ribbon or other ribbons for that matter, for the sake of driving their sales and really exploiting the pain of, of our people. So today I honor those who um, are among the ancestors who fought a good fight. I honor those survivors and thrivers right now. We have several of them on um, on right now. I honor those who are um, in, in grieving, who are in fresh grief from those that they may have um, lost or dealing with some very painful times. Um, we are holding space for you and sending love and light and um, keeping you held close to, to our hearts. Um, and I'll leave you with this for the breast cancer portion of this. You know, when Cancer Cannot was developed, um, when I was first diagno diagnosed, my uh, dear friend uh, Dawn um, just kept saying, Cancer Cannot, Cancer Cannot. Um, and, and we turned that into, Cancer can do a lot of things, right? But what it cannot do is certain things in my world like steal my joy or steal my power in advocating for myself or making the best of a very challenging situation or loving myself beyond aesthetics or having grace for myself when I'm not feeling well and I don't have best days, that is okay. Like feeling all the feels and having the grace to feel it. So cancer can, may be able to try to do a lot of things, but what it cannot is still who we are and how we show up in the world with or without our diagnosis, with our friends and loved ones and beloveds who have been diagnosed. So let us continue to be powerful agents um, through these diagnoses and to continue to support one another and be advocates. And we will not let anyone um, dictate our lives and our livelihood based on racism or capitalism or um, marginalization and oppression. Uh, we got to call that out, right? Hey, brother, always, always good to see you, Larry. Grateful for your presence. So with that, let's shift to domestic violence uh, because this is our, our last part of this series, but we will continue to talk about domestic violence because the more we talk about it, the more we remove the silence, the shame, um, the secrecy, we, we remove the, the power from it the best we can. And um, so one, Soul to Soul Sisters is having a panel discussion on this coming Thursday uh, to close out the month to talk about healing beyond the violence, 
um, what does healing look like beyond the violence? So I invite each of you um, to go on to the Soul to Soul Sisters Facebook page, I think tomorrow or later on today, and there is an event. You can register um, so that we can keep in touch with you. You can register with a pseudonym, you, you know, a fake name um, to protect yourself because these are things that we have to think about when victims are trying to get help and trying to get support, um, sometimes things need to be anonymous, um, unfortunately. So um, we will have, and it'll the the um, you can register, but you can also just watch it streaming live on our YouTube channel or our Soul to Soul Sisters Facebook page. It is Thursday, and I'm getting the time zones mixed up. I think it's at six mountain time. Last week I said another time, but I will share that information on my Facebook page so that um, you have the accurate information to join us on Thursday. It's it's um, for Black women uh, healing beyond um, the violence, right? Healing beyond the violence. So I, a couple of resources um, with domestic violence awareness um, last week we talked about what does a, a safety plan look like and who is called to help the perpetrator. And I still insert that into this narrative today. Who, what does a safety plan look like? What does a safety plan look like when your uh, perpetrator or abuser knows your family, was successful with isolating you, has control of all of the, the finances. Um, oh, cool. Mama Lovey shared an article um, from um, CNN about domestic violence. I will be sure to post this to my page and take a read. Thank you so much, Mama Lovey. I appreciate it. Yeah, please continue to share resources and um, because the more we know, the more we are able to then combat and end domestic violence. So with that, um, you know, these the safety plans and, and keeping our, not only the victim trying to move into survivor safe, but keeping children safe and family and friends and coworkers and colleagues, we can probably list, everybody on here could probably list two or three stories, either personally or someone that they know or something that they read about in their community or in, you know, uh, an article in the paper, or like Mama Lovey just shared um, about heinous acts in the workplace, um, you know, right outside of someone's home, inside someone's home, in the church. Uh, we talked about spirituality, right? That was a big conversation last week about spiritual abuse, because if we look at the, the sacred text, um, the sacred text often uses um, very, what I perceive as violent language, right? So there's a lot of wars going on, there's rape happening, there is demeaning and a diminishing of women, and it's right there in our sacred text. And, and what we are called to do, like people like Reverend Carolyn Habersham, is now debunking bad theology. So y'all watch out for her um, Thursday live broadcast where she is really going to have the hard conversation, courageous conversation about scripture and spirituality and how we need to debunk using these um, scriptures to dehumanize or degrade or demean another because this is what abusers do. Spiritual abuse is about using the scripture or dismissing or disrespecting your spiritual tradition and then making that either that tradition or another tradition work in the abuser's um, on the abuser's behalf, right? In their favor, right? So. Um, you know, we're going to really talk about and dig deep. I say we, like I'm down with it, Mother. Mother Carolyn's going to talk about, you know, things like that. Not necessarily just domestic violence, but holistically because spiritual um, abuse and church hurt is real and it's long overdue for us to talk about it. And with domestic violence, um, domestic violence, um, if you look at the resources, definitely comes in different forms, whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional, uh, financial, 
Um, yeah, all of that. So it's not always about the, the bruises, right? It's not, not always about that. It's, 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 it's verbal, um, abuse. And there are times when people don't even realize that they are in an abusive relationship because we don't talk about it. If we talk about it and we bring it to the forefront, and, and my story is the perfect example. I found out in class in seminary. My pastoral care professor brought in a guest. They talked about domestic violence. I looked at that power and control reel, wheel and I was like, that's me. And the rest is history. I'm glad I'm here to tell the story. Thank you, God. Um, so people don't know. And then you say, well, how can you not know? And that, that we don't need that type of response and that type of language and that type of approach. If you're not going to be helpful and you're going to be further demeaning and degrading and abusive, then don't say anything. Don't say anything. Call the national domestic violence hotline and do what you need to do and step back. If you can't be there with a person and meet a person where they are and speak love and light and covering and support of, of this, this person who is in a domestic violence relationship, right? So when, um, when you are so deeply entrenched in something, you really can't see beyond. And if you don't have the language and you don't know, then you really don't know that you are experiencing this thing called domestic violence. Violence, you start to think, oh, it's my fault. Oh, I shouldn't have argued. Oh, I shouldn't have fought back. Oh, I should have had dinner ready. Oh, I shouldn't have called my friend, you, whatever. It's, it's always something. And then we start to blame ourselves as victims because we don't really see that this is about power and control and our abuser is just slowly taking our power away through isolation, through intimidation, through various forms of abuse, through um, threatening taxic, tactics, through manipulation, the biggest manipulators. And then people say, oh, I would have never have thought he, he or she was such a good, or is such a good. Let us learn to listen. And actively listens means listening deep. Like I am really intent on listening to every word you have to say. I'm not listening for a response. I'm not listening because I was triggered and now I need to respond to you and take out my feelings on you because I was triggered by what you said. It's really learning to love beyond measure and to listen deeply, right? So I wanna lift up some things. So there's a website, nomore.org. It's scrolling on the ticker on the bottom. And No More is um, to bring awareness not only to domestic violence, but also sexual abuse. So I love this organization. Um, they partner with other organizations year round to bring light, to bring awareness to um, this heinous act called domestic violence. And, and here are some numbers, um, which of course we know that these numbers are, are, are there are people behind these numbers and these numbers are probably even greater, right? We can only document what we know, what people actually report. And unfortunately people are scared to report because who do you go to when police are killing black and brown bodies? when there's a state sanctioned violence going on, who do you go to? How do you escape? Who do you call when you are in the midst of a violent moment? One in four women and one in nine men, nine men experience violence from their partners in their lifetime. One in three teens experience sexual or physical abuse or threats from a boyfriend or girlfriend in a year. One in five women are survivors of rape. One in three women and one in six men have experienced sexual violence in their lives. 
one in four women and one in six men were sexually abused before the age of 18. And these are numbers that we know. That means that everybody watching today, somebody, statistically, everyone watching, someone has been impacted one way, shape, or form through some form of violence, right? So um, one of the things that, um, what I love about uh, this website is on the homepage, um, it talks about COVID and domestic violence and how the numbers are just surging um, during these times, uh, COVID-19 and domestic violence. To stop the spread of COVID-19, we were asked to stay at home, but home isn't a safe place for everyone. With victims increasingly trapped at home with their abusers, global domestic violence cases surged. Even as lockdowns were lifted, this remains a critical time for survivors. So they came up with a campaign, um, listening from home, friends and neighbors can save a life. No more and the National Domestic Violence Hotline are encouraging bystanders to get help if they witness or suspect domestic violence. And then they're doing a hashtag isolated, not alone. No more and the body shop are empowering bystanders and supporting victims of domestic violence during COVID-19 health crisis. So that, that sounds great, that sounds good. Now let's bring it to some examples and some real tangible, concrete examples. Because if I am a bystander and I'm listening, I beg the question again, who do I call? Who do I call if I hear, and mind you, when I was in seminary, and when I was in an abusive relationship in my dorm room, we did not have soundproof rooms. I know my classmates heard what was going on and did nothing. But what were they to do? Because we tell folk, don't get involved, like physically, because you may end up getting hurt as well. It's challenging to call the police because you just never know what officer is going to show up at your door. If they are going to justify the abuse, are they going to arrest the abuser? Are they going to believe the abuser and end up arresting the victim or asking the victim to leave? And then what happens after that? If the, the victim then has an opportunity to leave, where does he or she go? We have shelters that are filled to capacity, shelters that are not, um, not the best accommodations, not necessarily the safest accommodations, and many of them don't deal with domestic violence, mental illness. Tina Rose in the building. You better say that. Facts. Right, sis? I love you so much. Y'all don't know how grateful I am my sister's on right now. I love her dearly. So where do you go? And then when they kick you out because your time is up, then where do you go? How, what, what are you eating? How, how are you going to work every day if now you no longer have to come on? We can go through this litany of stuff. So we got to create platforms. Hey, Regina. We, oh, y'all, I love y'all. Regina says we need to have conversations with our youth about teen dating violence. Absolutely. Because some people think it's cute. Oh, he loves me. And some adults. But for teens, it starts early. And we need to talk about what that teen dating violence, violence looks like. Remember, there was a time when a, a, a spouse um, couldn't rape their partner. Right? Um, and jail sucks. Can we just pause right there? 
So not only are we being victimized by our perpetrator, by our abuser, then we're further victimized by the places that were designed to protect us and shelters to keep us safe. And then we may even be further victimized by the system that is called to protect and serve. And then another system, mass incarceration, and you end up staying in jail for quite a long time for either something you didn't do, can't afford a low bail, further marginalization, further abuse from officers. I mean, this downward spiral, let's talk together about healing and what that looks like and letting these victims know that, beloved, I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy. And what can we do? What may we do to help to keep you and your family safe? Systems that need to be built centering black women and black marginalized, silenced, abused women. Because those are where the higher numbers are. Because when you deal with the most marginalized and you stand on the margins, the margin just, margins disappear. That's a quote from a father in uh, Father Boyle in California. Right. You stand on the margins, they disappear. So deal with those who are most affected and then other people will then be able to um, to heal from that. Um, Tina says spiritual communities need to talk about sex, sexual soul ties and trauma bonds. Didn't we just talk about this last week? We went into a deep conversation about this. We need to talk about this. Trauma bonds? Tina, you on to something right there. Ooh. Healing ain't easy. Thank God it is possible. And it's possible because it takes a village and it takes a community. It's possible because someone needs to see the healing and the healed. Someone needs to see the process of the healing to be encouraged. Someone needs to experience a community that is going to hold them and love them um, with, with beyond measure, with, with unconditional positive regard to get them on the road to healing. Because in this moment of abuse, in this moment of a cancer diagnosis, it's very easy not to see the light at the end of the tunnel. When people around you are dying, mind, body, and soul. Tina says mental disease sufferers have much higher risk of being susceptible. It's so much. Absolutely. And we don't, we don't even, we don't deal with mental dis-ease on a day-to-day -day basis. And then when you start to compound it with other stuff, it makes it even more complex. Right. So for, for healing to happen, the judgment has got to go away. It's got to diminish. And we've got to love people beyond measure. I usually don't say have to, must, got to, but today we got to do better. <laughs> we got to do more when it comes to domestic violence. We got to create communities that is going to keep our beloved safe and then to keep them on a road of healing so that they can survive and thrive. Making sure that they are hired with, with livable wages, making sure that they receive the mental um, help that they need and stop thinking that mental health and support and counseling and therapy and, and seeing a psychiatrist is a negative thing. It is to help us to be healthy and whole. And if we start preaching that and speaking that and living that and encouraging our beloveds to do the same, some will, it'll be successful for some others. It may not be as successful as quickly. And then there are others where 
prayer and support, like I'm here. Because you, at some point, you got to want it for yourself. And unfortunately, people are so entrenched in this. It's hard to even want it for yourself because of shame and fear. Regina said, making sure their kids have um, the support um, they need. Absolutely. Switching schools. Making sure that kids don't share where they live. <laughs> the secrecy. Oh, beloveds. Beloveds, beloveds. Together it is possible. Thank you so much for addressing this topic so, topic so candid. I'm glad I tuned in. I love you, Ashe. I love you too, sister. Thank you. So as we close, um, I did intentionally want to close on the, the healing piece and really putting some concrete, um, tangible stories and things that, that, um, that we can think about when we wear the purple ribbon or, um, if someone is in need that there are resources out there, but then we, we, we have an opportunity to learn how to center ourselves as black women, as black men in this and say, does this apply to me? Does this work for me? Does this escape plan work for me? Or is this privileged? Does this escape plan work for me? Because I don't have a six figure job. Or does this escape plan work for me? I don't have a grandparent's house to go to up in the, you know, mountain somewhere. So does this safety plan work for us? Does the National Domestic Violence Hotline work for us? Do these local shelters and spaces and places work for us? And then if not, how do we come together as community and call them in? Just like we do uh, efforts to end anti-Black racism, we need to end that in these domestic violence shelters and in, you know, the police, it's a whole different story, but in these, these places that are called to help us and to serve us, making sure we pour money into those to make sure that we get the help because we are a very unique, divine, dynamic, complex people, beautiful people. And some people don't know how to handle us because we're not linear. We're not one way. We're not individualistic, right? It's so much more to us. So how do we deal with all of this? All it is divine, this divinity, this magic, this mysticism in the midst of domestic violence, beloved. Good afternoon, my friend. So with that, as we move forward and beyond Domestic Violence Awareness Month, those who are called, those who want to help, those who want to find out more about how we can galvanize as the black diaspora to build systems and spaces and places for our people to get the help and the healing that they need to remain safe, to, to hold the perpetrators accountable and responsible. Um, yeah, think about that. Think about beyond what you see. And as we vote, Soul to Soul Sisters has a black woman's voter guide. And what I love about this voter guide is that although it's centered in Colorado, go to our website and take a look at this black woman's voter guide because it looks beyond what is presented before us. It looks rep uh, representative uh, Benavita. When I was on a panel discussion the other day, she says, sometimes you can change a word in a ballot measure and it'll change the total intent of the measure. So pay attention. You may think, oh, it's just one word. All people should vote. All eligible people should work, should vote. Big difference. So if we can look beyond these platforms and these things that are put together that are supposed to help us to ensure that they're speaking life into Black lives and the Black experience. Beloveds, vote. This is voting season. We no longer have an election day per se. Every day of early voting is election day. Um, don't get caught up on election day unless it's 
absolutely necessary. I do understand some people can't take off or whatever, but fill out your ballot, use the drop box. In most places, you, it's too late to mail it. Use the uh, voting service centers, get out there and vote if you can. If you are eligible, vote if you can. If you don't know, go onto your state's website and find out if you are eligible go ahead and register. It's not too late to register, depending on what state you're in, and let us make this happen. We must redirect our money back into our own community forever. Absolutely. Yes, and here, thank you, Regina. On Soul to Soul Sisters website, here is a link for the voter guide, so you can just click on it, take a look at it. May it inspire you to go out and use your voice and to be as powerful as you are called to be. Much love and light to those who are in domestic violence situations. May um, community, may God, may spirit um, cover you and bring you the resources that you need to get you and your family and your beloved's help to get you safe to get you on the track of um, living and, and not uh, being abused and threatened at the hands of your abuser or perpetrator. All of those who are experiencing breast cancer in one way, shape, or form, sending you love and light and healing. And may you continue to realize that cancer cannot steal your joy. Cancer cannot steal the divine in you. Cancer cannot steal the love that you have for yourself and living your best life, even in the midst of diagnosis. I love you dearly. Thank you for rocking with me through this very personal and, and trying journey. Those of you have, who have missed it, we have, this is the fourth episode. So there are three other episodes. Um, you can watch them on my Facebook page. You can go to my YouTube page channel, or you can go on to Spotify, hashtag Tuesdays with Tawana and listen to part one, two, and three, and you've already experienced part four. Part four. I love you dearly. God bless each of you. You bring so much love to my world, and I am so grateful. Let's build community together. All right, Tuesdays with Tawana. I'm out. Peace. Stop the violence. <laughs>